We still have two months to go between now and the July meeting. That will mean we will also have two more inflation readings where I will not so much be interested in the headline and the energy. In a sense, from a monetary policy perspective, that is yesterday's news. But it will contain information on the underlying dynamics in, in, uh, in inflation. And these underlying dynamics, of course, eh, have the potential to influence inflation expectations. And I think, eh, as to the future policy path, our president has set it out very clearly in what I think is an excellent block that we will be guided by the principles of data dependency. Well, we have two more data points to come. Full optionality. That means that we don't exclude certain moves uh, beforehand. And gradualism. Gradualism is absolutely desirable, desirable to have, to be predictable and not to add to uh, further uncertainty. But there is a small but to gradualism, and that is that, and that is also, by the way, in the block, that we can only afford gradualism if inflation expectations remain well anchored. If you now look at the various measures of inflation expectations in the euro area, they are now, what I would say, at the upper limit of still being well anchored. So they are still well anchored. If that continues to be the case, I'm all for gradualism. But we have to keep an open mind, retain full optionality for a possibility that new information might come in that might challenge that view. I understand that no member can pre-commit on what the Council will deliver. But when Germany presents a PPI number in excess of 30%, that looks pretty exceptional and pretty abnormal. Just give us some nuance. Is the inclination to move faster rather than slower on the rate moves? Um, the French central bank governor saying on my panel yesterday, it seems pretty much a done deal as far as July and September are concerned. Is that right? Um, well, I mean, I have to judge, of course... 30 per cent on... plus on PPI. Yeah, no, that That's is... Well that, anchored, no, that, is no, but that is, in a way... That is what we know, right? I mean, a lot of it is energy. A lot of it is due to negative supply shocks. We are for the difficult. We stand for the difficult task to disentangle the couple of negative supply shocks we've had from also very strong demand, and we have to respond to the demand side. The 33% you are mentioning is, to a very large extent, also a result of the negative supply shock. We know that that will be a temporary shock. There is not much we central bankers can do about energy price inflation, but you can and must hold us accountable for avoiding that that temporary bout of high inflation becomes entrenched. And that is why I am more focused on indicators of underlying inflation. And that is the one to follow, and that will also affect inflation expectations going forward. But you know the market is very fixated on a number, 25 or 50. Just to be very clear, 50 is not off the table at the July or September meetings. No, as far as I'm concerned, not. And uh, the way I read the blog of our president, it's clearly not off the table. Excellent. Um, let me ask you, um, the market believes that there will be no move in the June meeting. And that's because of uh, what is happening in terms of the guidance that stipulates that rates only rise when um, the bond buying ends. Um, does that very clearly then and explicitly mean we can't expect a, an earlier move than July at the June meeting because of concerns about unanchoring of inflationary pressure? The answer is yes. We have been very clear about the sequencing. Uh, that we will first end asset purchases. We will end them in Q3. I think it's very likely to understand that we will end them very, 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 very early in Q3. And I don't think it takes much imagination what the first moment in Q3 uh, will be. But until that time, we will not touch rates. So rates will only be at the table in July. The perception, I would say, in the market, you may or may not agree with it, is that the ECB has fallen behind the Federal Reserve um, and it, it's fallen behind the Bank of England in terms of its response to these inflationary pressures. And that is behind the euro's weakness and that is stoking imported inflation and it's increasing the imbalances in trade terms with the United States. 
Is that also why it's important at this stage, even though I know you don't target a level for the euro, let's make that very clear, but do you think that is something that is worrisome and that needs to be observed carefully by the ECB at this stage? Well, there's a lot in your question. First of all, the fact that the ECB is behind in time, uh, the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve, that has a good reason. Because in our case, it's clearly the balance between supply, negative supply and positive demand shocks is different from that in the US. Our inflation problem is also more muted still. Definitely, if you look at indicators of underlying inflation. So that explains why we are three to six months, let me put it like that, behind, for instance, the Federal Reserve. Now, that has ramifications for the exchange rate. Yes, the euro dollar exchange rate has an impact on energy prices. So it has a short term sort of feedback loop, which even increases the loss of purchasing power for our citizens. And that's why I think we should also be attentive uh, to, this, uh, to this mechanism. 